Okay, over the past few years since the coronavirus pandemic spread around the world, the world has changed dramatically. One of the ways that the world has changed dramatically is by the policies that Western governments have put in place to combat the coronavirus pandemic from spreading, to stop the spread or slow the spread. And the balance that government officials either have tried to maintain or courts have forced them to maintain in terms of the tension between public safety concerns and individual liberty. One of the most prominent debates in this area has been the mask mandates. If you recall, originally President Trump was not such a fan of uh, masking. Later, he did wear a mask and encourage others to wear a mask, claiming that it was patriotic duty. And then one of the first things that President Joe Biden did when he came into office was issue an executive order mandating masks in all uh, public government places. And we're going to talk about today the mask mandate on international travel and even national travel in airports, population centers, public places such as train stations. Recently, the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, had an order outstanding to expand the mask mandate for another period of time on all flights and transportation hubs, etc. And there was a U.S. district court decision that put an end to that. That's what we're going to focus on here today. And as I understand that these issues are contentious, some people were extremely happy, some people were scared, and there's a lot of emotions involved on both sides. My goal here is to approach this subject like we approach constitutional law cases of similar significance in constitutional law classes, that they're not politics classes, but we have a safe space where we can discuss the facts. And, you know, if this was live, I'd ask students to, or I'd encourage students to participate and share their views based on logic and their perceptions of the case law, et cetera. Um, And what I try to do is stay out of the political realm and focus more on the legal realm, what the court says and the reactions to the court and centers of power. So that's what we're going to try to do here. We're going to try our best, although this is a politically contentious, heavy issue and it's still fresh and new and people are on both sides very passionate, emotionally passionate about it. We're going to try our best to focus specifically on the law, leaving the um, policies to be debated by different type of political people. So today we're focusing on Health Freedom Defense Fund versus President Biden. The official name of this case, the full name was the Health Freedom Defense Fund Incorporated, Anna Carolina Daza and Sarah Pope, plaintiffs versus Joe Biden Jr. in his official capacity as president of the United States et al. There were some other defendants as well as we'll talk about like the CDC, etc. And this was a case that was just recently decided in the United States District Court Middle District of Florida, Tampa Division. It's quite a lengthy opinion. If you read it for yourself, it's like 55 pages. Even though it's a district court opinion, it reads like an appellate decision. It's very intricate. The judge, when she was appointed, she was only 33 years old. Here she's 35 years old. She clerked for Justice Thomas on the Supreme Court before she was put forward to the Senate by President Trump. And so there's a lot going on here, and I'm excited to jump into this with you today, talk about the case and the ramifications for it moving forward. All right, so we had this federal law requiring wearing a mask in airports, train stations, and other transportation hubs, as well as on airplanes, buses, trains, and most other public conveyances in the United States, with failure to comply resulting in possible civil and criminal penalties, including removal from the conveyance. This masking requirement was from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, a regulation published in the Federal Register on February 3rd, 2021. So how do we get here? Well, basically, COVID-19. So the 19 part is because the virus was discovered in 2019. And in December of 2019, this highly contagious respiratory virus known as depending on who you ask, the China virus, coronavirus, COVID, you know, pick your poison, right? It began spreading throughout the world. 
A month later, the Secretary of Health and Human Services declared COVID-19 a public health emergency. And then on March 13th, 2020, President Trump declared COVID-19, the outbreak of COVID-19, a national emergency. COVID-19 continued to spread throughout 2020 despite experiments with unprecedented movement restrictions and social distancing measures. And by the end of 2020, approximately 20 million Americans had been infected with the disease and over 360,000 Americans had died from it. And the fall and winter of 2020 also brought a spike in new coronavirus infections. This is from the language of the opinion of the court. It's the spike. I don't know if that's meant as a pun or not. This spike was due in part to emerging variants of the virus, some of which were more severe than the original strain and more easily transmissible. The number of new cases actually peaked in January 2021 and then steadily decreased in February. So President Biden takes office in January 2021. On January 21st, which is one day after he took the oath of office, President Biden issued Executive Order 13998, and this recognized the threats of the continuing COVID-19 pandemic and reasoned that mask wearing can mitigate the risk of travelers spreading COVID-19. So the order directed executive officials to require masks on various forms of transportation and while in transit hubs. Then approximately two weeks later, on February 3rd, 2021, the CDC published the mask mandate. That's what we're going to be dealing with here. The mask mandate is what's primarily at issue in this litigation. Now, what are the nuts and bolts of the mask mandate? So, first of all, we have to say up front that the, the court points out that the, and, and this is really, this is the lead up to the procedural issues that the court really will take issue with. The CDC published the mask mandate without allowing public participation through the regular notice and comment procedures that we'll talk about more later on in this case study, but which are really a hallmark of administrative law. So as a basis for dispensing with these ordinary APA procedures, the CDC found that it would be impracticable and contrary to the public's health to delay the mandate to seek public comment. In the mandate, the CDC explained that COVID-19 spreads very easily between people who are in close contact. And this spread occurs mainly through the transfer of these respiratory droplets from one to another. So the CDC found that masks prevent this spread by blocking exhaled virus and reducing inhalation of these droplets. Specifically because the CDC found that COVID-19 can be spread by pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic individuals, the CDC said that masks are one of the most effective strategies available for reducing the transmission of the virus. Now, the mandate did not differentiate between kinds of masks based on how effective they are in blocking transmission. It simply included a footnote that included guidance for, you know, better masks and which masks were either, you know, manufactured or homemade versus, you know, should you use this metal or should you have a valve or things like that. That was really just relegated to a footnote, wasn't part of the actual administrative regulation. So the mask mandate requires that a person must wear a mask while boarding, disembarking, and traveling on any conveyance into or within the United States. The reach extends to aircraft, train, road vehicles, including like ride-sharing services like Uber, vessels, and other means of transport. It also applies beyond conveyances to any transportation hub, meaning like any airport, bus terminal, seaport, subway station, train station, U.S. port of entry, any location that provides transportation subject to the jurisdiction of the United States. And in addition, it also enlists conveyance operators, basically people who are going to be policing the population to make sure they're wearing masks. And it requires operators to use their best efforts to enforce the masking mandate. So though broad in scope, the mandate provides exceptions to limit its coverage based on the person, the conveyance, or the situation. So the mandate excludes children under the age of two and people with a disability, preventing them from being able to safely wear a mask. But that only applies if individuals who cannot wear a mask, if it's because of a disability that's within the scope of the Americans with Disabilities Act. It also excludes personal non-commercial use of vehicles and commercial vehicles operated by a single person. And third, it excludes situations where, for example, a person must wear an oxygen mask 
or is actively eating, drinking, or taking medication, or must remove the mask to verify his identity or to catch his breath after, quote-unquote, feeling winded, or to communicate with someone who's hearing impaired. So now we get to the drama drama. All right. So Health Freedom Defense Fund, Anna Daza and Sarah Pope sued to challenge the mask mandate on July 12th of 2021. Daza and Pope routinely travel by airplane. Daza has anxiety that's aggravated by wearing masks. Daza alleges that the government does not recognize her anxiety as a basis for a medical exception from the mandate. And similarly, Pope flew regularly before the pandemic, but has done so less since the CDC imposed the mask mandate as the constricted breathing from wearing a mask provokes or exacerbates her panic attacks. Health Freedom Defense Fund is a nonprofit organization that opposes laws and regulations that force individuals to submit to the administration of medical products, procedures, and devices against their will. Health Freedom represents the interests of its members who are subject to the mask mandate, at least one of whom has alleged harms sufficient to establish standing in her own right, the court says. The government does not dispute that at least some plaintiffs have standing under Article 3 to challenge the CDC's transportation mask order because it imposes a legal obligation on the individual plaintiffs to wear masks when using public transportation. So what do the plaintiffs want? Well, seeking a declaratory judgment that the mask mandate is unlawful and to have it set aside under the APA, plaintiffs sued President Joe Biden, Secretary of Health and Human Services Xavier Becerra, CDC Director Rochelle Walensky, and Director of the CDC's Division of Global Migration and Quarantine, Martin Cetron, all in their official capacities. Plaintiffs also sued the CDC and the United States of America. And plaintiffs' amended complaint challenges the CDC's mask mandate on several grounds. First, it alleges that the mandate exceeds the CDC's statutory authority. In the alternative, it alleges that if the mandate is statutorily authorized, Congress improperly delegated its legislative power to the CDC. The amended complaint further alleges that the CDC improperly invoked the good cause exception to avoid the notice and comment procedures required under the APA. Finally, it alleges that the mandate violates the APA because it is arbitrary and capricious. Now, also just to note, originally plaintiffs initially challenged the lawfulness of President Biden's January 21st executive order um, with two other counts, but they withdrew those counts, those claims in their motion for summary judgment. And with that withdrawal, President Biden was actually due to be terminated as a defendant to this action. So what the court's going to do is proceed to discuss each of the plaintiff's remaining claims. So first, the plaintiffs claim that the mask mandate exceeds the CDC's authority under the Public Health Services Act. Because administrative agencies are creatures by statute, they possess only the authority that Congress has provided. And in issuing the mask mandate that requires most persons to wear masks over the mouth and nose when traveling on any conveyance into or within the United States, the director of the CDC relied on a section of the Public Health Services Act of 1944, the PHSA, for authority, which is codified under 42 U.S.C. Section 264A, and 42 CFR 70.2 actually delegates the regulatory authority under the statute to the CDC, and that provision empowers him to promulgate regulations aimed at identifying, isolating, and destroying diseases. Other sections of the PHSA also provide the CDC with a limited power to apprehend, detain, examine, or provide conditions for the release of individuals coming into a state or possession from a foreign country or traveling between states, but only when the CDC reasonably believes that the person is infected with a communicable disease and is a probable source of infection to others. In such a situation, the CDC may detain the individual if, upon inspection, he is found to be infected. Interestingly, the court goes on to talk about how since Congress enacted it in 1944, the PHSA has generally been limited to quarantining infected individuals and prohibiting the import or sale of animals known to transmit diseases. It's really rarely been invoked, at least until recently. Within the past two years, the court says the CDC has found within Section 264A the power to shut down the cruise ship industry, 
stop landlords from evicting tenants who have not paid their rent and require that persons using public conveyances wear masks. Courts have concluded that the first two of these measures exceeded the authority that the CDC had under Section 264. There was a case, the uh, Alaska Association of Realtors, which was heard uh, over the past year, and that basically explained that the eviction moratorium likely exceeded the scope of Section 264A. And then there was another case from the Middle District of Florida in 2021, Florida versus Becerra, which uh, basically held that the CDC's conditional sale order exceeded the statutory authority under 264A. And the court here says no court has yet ruled on the legality of the third, the mask mandates. And that's obviously what the court here is going to do. The court says at first blush, it appears more closely related to the powers granted in Section 264A than either the sale order or the eviction memorandum. But after rigorous statutory analysis, the court concludes that Section 264A does not authorize the CDC to issue the mask mandate. So it's interesting what the court does here. You know, if you're just watching the news or something, they're not going to read this whole opinion and and go through it in detail. They're just kind of going to give you an overview and you're going to miss the nitty gritty here. So the court here says the first thing they have to do is determine the meaning of a statutory provision. So the, the court first has to look at language, giving the words used their ordinary meaning. And so the opening sentence of Section 264A grants the CDC power to issue regulations that, in its judgment, are necessary to prevent the spread of communicable disease. And the second section informs the grant of authority by illustrating the kinds of measures that could be necessary, specifically introspection, fumigation, disinfection, sanitation, pest extermination, and destruction of contaminated animals and articles. So what the court says is that if the CDC has the authority that it's claiming here, it's got to be in one of these words in the second section here, in the second sentence. The power to do so must be found in one of these actions that are enumerated. It's got to be either inspection, fumigation, disinfection, sanitation, something like that. And the court says, first of all, it's pretty obvious that you know making somebody wear a mask is not inspection, fumigation, disinfection, destruction, or pest extermination, and the government doesn't claim it is. Instead, the government argues that the mask mandate is a sanitation, a sanitation measure, or another measure akin to sanitation. And what's interesting is that the PHSA does not define sanitation, so the court has to start by figuring out what does sanitation mean. So it looks to dictionaries. Um, Specifically, it says, you know, the statute was enacted in the 1940s. So let's look at dictionaries from that time period to figure out what sanitation means. And the court looks and says, well, it means first, you know, removal of, you know, filth or something like that or washing your hands or plumbing. Second, it could be to keep something clean. So after the court goes through pretty extensive analysis, like getting these definitions from the dictionary, whatever, it says, put simply, sanitation as used under this statute in the PHSA could have referred to active measures to clean something or to preserve the cleanliness of something, but that is not what's going on with the mask mandate, right? So the court has to figure out which of those two meanings does the statute really rely upon here? And so the court has to look to what it calls the statute's context, including the surrounding words, the statute's structure and history, and common usage at the time. This is really what I meant by it's more like an appellate decision than a trial court decision, in a sense. And ultimately, after concluding a pretty rigorous analysis, the court says that the first sense, that of active cleaning, is what statutory interpretation should be here, is the intent that the Congress meant when um, talking about sanitation in Section 264A. So the government ultimately says, wearing a mask cleans nothing. At most, it traps virus droplets. But it neither sanitizes the person wearing the mask nor sanitizes the conveyance. Because the CDC required mask wearing as a measure to keep something clean, explaining that it limits the spread of COVID through prevention, but never contending that it actively destroys or removes it, the mask mandate falls outside of Section 264A. And so after a lengthy discussion, the court says in sum, the context of the nearby words, the contemporary usage, the implications of the government's definition, and the history of Section 264 suggest that sanitation and other measures like sanitation are far narrower than the government posits. Okay, secondly, the plaintiffs claimed in count number two or whatever it was in the original amended complaint 
the mask mandate improperly invoked the good cause exception to notice and comment rulemaking. We'll talk more about this as we go on, but basically a hallmark of administrative law is that the public needs to have input before an administrative agency makes a change to a rule. The theory behind that is that these are bureaucrats, right? Congress delegates rulemaking authority to an executive agency and like they're not really accountable to the people. So they at least have to hear from the people um, to, to have some sort of accountability. So the way the court puts it is that the APA requires that agencies provide an opportunity for the public to review and comment upon a new rule before it becomes legally binding. You can see sec uh, 5 United States Code, Section 553B. So what this means is that the agency must publish a notice in the Federal Register that includes reference to the legal authority under which the rule is proposed and either the terms or substance of the proposed rule or a description of the subjects and issues involved. And then following publication, the agency must give interested persons an opportunity to participate in the rulemaking through submission of written data, views, or arguments. This comment period has to be at least 30 days. And finally, the agency must consider and respond to significant comments received during the period for public comment. This is known as a process called notice and comment, and it permits interested parties to criticize projected agency action before the action is embedded in a final rule and allows the agency to also benefit from the party's suggestions. It also attempts to provide a surrogate political process to constrain the exercise of legislative power that Congress has delegated to an otherwise undemocratic and unaccountable rulemaking process. That's what I was basically, I think that's perhaps the most important part here. But, you know, I'm a little biased because I teach constitutional law. So here the CDC did not allow for public participation through notice and comment before issuing the mask mandate. Accordingly, the court says, Promulgation of the mandate violated the APA unless an exception to the ordinary rulemaking procedure applies. The court says despite its importance, the APA provides narrow exceptions to notice and comment. Really because, you know, notice and comment are really like the most important elements in procedural due process. So two of these elements are relevant here, the court says. The first is when an agency action is not a rule, and the second is when the agency properly invokes good cause to forego notice and comment. Here, the court says that the mask mandate improperly invoked the order and interpretive rule exceptions to notice and comment. So basically, the APA's notice and comment procedures apply only to agency rulemaking, which is a process of making a rule of general or particular applicability and future effect and does not apply to a case-by-case -case adjudication which results in an order. Mask mandate here itself claims that it's not a rule within the meaning of the APA. But the court doesn't buy that because it says the government abandoned that untenable position on review. The court says the mask mandate is a generally applicable standard governing conduct and rights, and therefore it's clearly a rule, and therefore clearly subject to the notice and comment procedures required by the APA. So the only question that remains here is whether the CDC had good cause. And the court said it did not. The court said notice and comment does not apply when the agency for good cause finds and incorporates the finding and a brief statement of reasons in the rules issued that notice and public procedure thereon are impracticable, unnecessary, or contrary to the public interest. The mandate invoked this exception to forego notice and comment. So the court has to determine whether a 30-day notice and comment period was impracticable, unnecessary, or contrary to the public interest. And the case law is very clear that the exception is to be narrowly construed and only reluctantly countenanced. Because, again, without this, there's a whole lot of power coming from the bureaucrats in Washington. And another uh, case from a circuit court that the court quotes here says that it applies, this exception applies only in emergency situations or where a delay could result in serious harm. So the court says here that the mandate asserted that there was good cause to dispense with prior public notice and comment because given the public health emergency caused by COVID-19, it would be impracticable and contrary to the public's health and by extension, the public's interest to delay the issuance and effective date of this order. Now, the court says this statement without more is insufficient 
to establish good cause to dispense with notice and comment. Mandates explanation, a single conclusory sentence does not carry its burden to, quote, show strong enough reason to invoke the good cause exception. And there's more case law that's very clear that says a mere recitation that good cause exists does not amount to good cause, nor does it allow the court to ensure that the CDC engaged in reasoned decision making. So the court says here that the only reason the mandate cites is the public health emergency caused by COVID-19. So that's certainly support for the promulgation of the mandate, but good cause to suspend notice and comment must be supported by more than the bare need for the regulations. And COVID-19 itself, the court says, does not always justify an agency bypassing notice and comment. Instead, the agency must identify specific reasons why there was good cause for dispensing with the usual notice and comment requirements and the particular environment the agency intended to regulate. And this mandate does not. The court says, nor does the mandate explain why a delay for public comment was contrary to the public's interest. Of course, delay, at least 30 days, is inherent in public comment, but the APA presumes that participation from the regulated public produces benefits that outweigh the costs, at least in the ordinary sense. And the court says here that besides its brief reference to the pandemic, the mandate makes no effort to explain its reasoning that there was an uh, exceptional circumstance at the time it implemented the rule. And so in the language of the court, the mandate's terse conclusion contrasts markedly with another regulation that addressed the COVID-19 pandemic and involved good cause to forego notice and comment. When the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services mandated that the staff of healthcare facilities receiving Medicare or Medicaid funding be vaccinated against COVID and provided almost four pages of reasoning with 40 footnotes of supporting sources on why there was good cause to forego notice and comment. It identified specific reasons to dispense with notice and comment that it supported with detailed explanation on the urgency presented by the ongoing pandemic, the outbreaks associated with the Delta variant and the ongoing influenza season. It also provided an estimated cost in human lives from a delay in issuing the vaccine mandate. So there, the Supreme Court concluded that this extensive reasoning properly invoked the good cause exception. But here, the court says, the mask mandate mustered a single conclusory sentence to support its invocation of good cause. And that's not going to fly. And furthermore, the mandate, the court says, fares no better when compared to non-COVID-19 related regulations that invoked good cause. Courts have found longer and more detailed assertions of good cause deficient, like in the Mack Trucks case, where the EPA, the court concluded, lacked good cause despite the rule's four reasons to dispense with notice and comment and eight paragraphs of explanation. And there was another case from 2017, National Venture Cap Association versus Duke, which concluded that the DHS's three paragraphs of explanation on good cause, that did not pass muster. So getting back to our case, the court says the CDC's failure to explain its reasoning is particularly problematic here. At the time when the CDC issued the mandate, the COVID-19 pandemic had been ongoing for almost a year and COVID-19 numbers in cases were decreasing. This timing undercuts the CDC's suggestion that its action was so urgent that a 30-day comment period was contrary to the public interest. So too, the court says, the CDC's delay in issuing the mandate further undercuts its position. The CDC issued the mandate in February of 2021, almost two weeks after the president called for a mandate, 11 months after the president had declared COVID-19 a national emergency, and almost 13 months since the Secretary of Health and Human Services had declared a public health emergency. So the court says this history suggests that the CDC itself did not find the passage of time particularly serious. So to be sure, the CDC needed time to deliberate on its proposed rule. Ordinarily, some of that deliberation occurs during the 30-day notice and comment period. Instead, here the court says the CDC spent approximately two weeks considering and drafting the mask mandate after the president called for it. Since an agency need publish only a description of the subjects and issues involved, not a complete rule, the CDC and the public's deliberation process could have partially overlapped. So providing for notice and comment may have added only another two weeks, or the CDC could have issued the mask mandate as a binding interim rule and allowed immediate notice and comment on a final version. Of course, 
The CDC was not required to do any of this or to consider all policy alternatives in reaching the decision, but the availability of these alternatives, the court says, undermines its conclusion that it had good cause to forego notice and comment due to the dangers of delay. Even more so, since the mandate does not address why these common sense approaches, which may have required minimal or no additional delay and certainly would have allowed interested parties an opportunity to submit their views, were infeasible or contrary to the public interest. And finally, the mandate's failure to explain is especially troubling because the benefits of public comment were at their zenith. The court says, first, the mandate governs the conduct of private individuals in their daily lives, and Section 553B ordinarily provides them the opportunity to participate in the formation of the rules by which they are to be regulated. And the more expansive the regulatory reach of agency rules, the greater the necessity for public comment. Second, the public has a heightened interest in participating in a regulation that would constrain their choices and actions via threats of civil and criminal penalties, which, as we said, that jumps in in this case. That's very applicable as well. Federal regulations similarly provide for a potential year of imprisonment for violate for violators and fines of up to $100,000 if a violation does not cause a death or up to $250,000 if it does result in a death. So there are serious fines here, so much so that the public should have, you know, had a chance to voice their opinion about it. And the court says, finally, especially in the context of health risks, notice and common procedures assure the dialogue necessary to the creation of reasonable rules. So despite the public interest involved, the availability of alternatives and the timing, the mandate here makes no effort to show the impracticability of affording notice and comment or that... Doing so was contrary to the public interest, nor is the mandate's invocation of good cause sufficient for the court to find that the CDC engaged in reasoned decision making when it found good cause. So this section basically ends by saying the court accepts the CDC's policy determination that requiring masks will limit COVID transmission and will thus decrease the serious illness and death that COVID-19 occasions. But that finding by itself is not sufficient to establish good cause. And the COVID-19 pandemic does not always justify an agency's bypassing of the notice and comment process. The court says far from it. Instead, the agency must, at the very least, identify specific reasons why, in the environment of the regulation, the ongoing pandemic constituted good cause, and the mandate here does not do that. So since the CDC issued the mask mandate without observance of procedure required by law, the court says that it's bound to hold it unlawful and set it aside under 5 U.S.C. Section 7062 because failure to provide notice and comment is a fundamental flaw that normally requires vacating of the rule. Okay, so if you're with me now, I know I'm sorry. I got really excited on the last one. There was a lot of con law issues that were flying around, and I know I, I, I get ramped up, and when I'm in fire, it just it goes fast. If you made it and you're still with me, congratulations to you because we're at the third and final claim of the trinity of claims that the court is considering here. So, um, so this one is <laughs> not as intense as the last, okay? So thanks for bearing with me. So the third one is that the plaintiffs claim that the mask mandate is arbitrary and capricious because the CDC failed to adequately explain its reasoning. And if you're with me this far and you've read the opinion up to this point, you know that this is going to be, you know, another slam dunk here um, on the court's purview, how the court sees this. You know, they just had a whole section in section two at the end where they were like, you know, hey, guys, you didn't explain what you were doing and that doesn't fly here. So the court says here, that the APA sets forth the procedures by, with fe by which federal agencies are accountable to the public and their actions subject to review by the courts. And it requires that agencies engage in reasoned decision making. When they fail to do so, courts have to set aside their actions as arbitrary or capricious. Plaintiffs here raise a number of arguments on why the mask mandate was arbitrary and capricious. They argue that the mandate failed to comply with 42 CFR section 70.2 and that the mandate was substantively unreasonable and that the mandate failed to adequately explain the CDC's reasoning. And right off the bat, the court says that we agree with the plaintiffs that the CDC failed to adequately, adequately explain its reasoning. So we don't even have to address whether the substantive decisions 
that are embodied in the mandate were themselves arbitrary or capricious or whether the mandate violated 42 CFR 70.2. In other words, again, the procedural issues here were a problem, even if the actual meat of the decision that the CDC decided was good, even so, we have a problem with the procedure. So the court says the APA's arbitrary and capricious review is very narrow, and the court may not substitute its judgment for that of the agency. Instead, the court is limited to ensuring that an agency's exercise of discretion was both reasonable and reasonably explained. An agency's decision is reasonably explained when the agency demonstrates that it engaged in reasoned decision making. And that means that the agency must examine the relevant data and articulate a satisfactory explanation for its action, including a rational connection between the facts found and the choice made. The articulated rationale must also be adequate to explain all major aspects of the decision. And while courts uphold a decision of less than ideal clarity, if the agency's path may reasonably be discerned, they may not supply a reasoned basis for the agency's action that the agency itself has not given. So the court says here, although a closer question than the failure to properly invoke the good cause exception, the mask mandate fails this reasoned explanation standard. Beyond the primary decision to impose a mask requirement, the mask mandate provides little or no explanation for the CDC's choices. Specifically, the CDC omits explanation for rejecting alternatives and for its system of exceptions. And there are many, the court says, such that the overall efficiency of masking on airplanes or other conveyances could reasonably be questioned. The mandate does not address alternative or supplementary requirements to masking, like testing temperature te checks or occupancy limits in transit hubs and conveyances. And it also does not explain why all masks, homemade and medical grade, are sufficient. Nor does it require social distancing or frequent hand washing, despite finding that these effective strategies work for reducing COVID transmission. So the court says, of course, the CDC did not need to explore every alternative device and thought conceivable by the mind of man. But an agency must consider and explain its rejection of reasonably obvious or significant and viable alternatives. And even if these alternatives were not so obvious that the CDC had to explain its decision to reject them, the mandate here fails to explain other significant choices. For example, the mandate relies on studies explaining that universal masking reduces transmission of COVID at the community level. But the mandate here does not require universal masking. It provides exceptions to individuals who are eating, drinking, or taking medication and a person who is experiencing difficulty breathing or is feeling winded. It also excludes individuals who cannot wear a mask due to an ADA-recognized disability and all children under two years of age. The mandate makes no effort to explain why its purposes, prevention of transmission and serious illness, allow for such exceptions, nor why a two-year-old is less likely to transmit COVID-19 than a 62-year-old. The CDC does not articulate a satisfactory explanation or any explanation at all for its action and fails to include a rational connection between the facts found and the choices made. Instead, it simply announces the exceptions. In sum, the court says, irrespective of whether the CDC made a good or accurate decision, it needed to explain why it acted as it did. Since the CDC did not explain its decision to compromise the effectiveness of its mandate by including exceptions or its decision to limit those exceptions, the court cannot conclude that the CDC articulated a rational connection between the facts found and the choices made. And so the decision is arbitrary and capricious and due to be set aside and remanded to the agency. Okay, so this brings us now to the ultimate court conclusion. Um, and you see on your screen who the judge was. I want to talk about her for just a minute before we get to the conclusion. I also just want to mention in the spirit of full transparency that I said earlier, this was a really long opinion. It was like, you know, 55 pages or something like that. I think it was long. It was 59 pages. I'm looking at it. I have it here on my desk. 59 pages. I went through it very carefully. I don't want to, you know, put anybody to sleep here. And it's not a law school class. 
So, you know, there were a few more nuances that we skipped over. There was a discussion, for example, of the Chevron Doctrine, the legal test for determining whether to grant deference to a government agency's interpretation of a statute which it administers. Um, there was a whole discussion of that. There was some more nitty gritty in the case about the government's arguments, but basically the court would say in each section, this is what we believe. We believe the plaintiffs are right. The government says this and this and this and this, and then, you know, they rip apart the government's logic. So I think this will give you the overview that you need, but you know, just be aware that there are some more nuances that we did not talk about. I didn't think were really relevant for this discussion here today. So this judge, Judge Catherine Kimball Mizell, she was the youngest person chosen by President Trump for a lifetime judicial appointment. She was um, put forward by President Trump and assumed office after confirmation in November of 2020. So after Biden had won the election and it was a lame duck session, Trump put her through. She went to school at the University of Florida's uh, law school. She got her Juris Doctor, summa cum laude, and she was a comments editor at the Florida Law Review. She graduated in 2012. So uh, she's young, and uh, maybe that will provide inspiration for any of you uh, young people who are watching this that, you know, you, you can do big things. When she graduated law school, she took a clerkship at the U.S. District Court in Florida. And after a year of that, she clerked at the U.S. Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit. Then she worked as a trial attorney at the Department of Justice in the Tax Division and then as an, a special assistant United States attorney in Virginia. Eventually, she clerked a little bit on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. And then from 2018 to 2019, she clerked for Justice Thomas on the Supreme Court. Okay, enough about her. Back to what we're supposed to be doing here. So at the end of the opinion here, she has a section that says the mask mandate is vacated for violating the APA, the again, the Administrative Procedure Act. And she says that the mandate exceeds the CDC's statutory authority and therefore violates the APA. Plaintiffs ask that the court declare it unlawful and set it aside. And the court says that this remedy mirrors the relief that they sought in their amended complaint. And the government argues that plaintiff's relief is limited to a declaratory judgment, and even if other relief is awarded, it should be limited to non-enforcement of the mask mandate just against the plaintiffs, not like, you know, against the entire American population. So the court looks first to the APA, the Administrative Procedure Act, and says that it requires that courts hold unlawful and set aside agency action that violates the APA or exceeds the agency's authority. And this is under 5 U.S.C. Section 706. And courts have long interpreted this provision as authorizing vacator, meaning you're going to vacate the judgment. That's the ordinary APA remedy, declaring it null and void. Additionally, the court says, the recognized exceptions to vacating for APA violations do not apply here. In deciding whether to award less than vacator relief, courts frequently consider the seriousness of the order's deficiencies and thus the extent of doubt whether the agency chose correctly and the disruptive consequences of an interim change that may itself be changed. But the court says here, the CDC cannot correct the serious deficiencies on remand, nor is the mask mandate a rule necessitating a significant administrative wind down period. And of course, the court says the government never asked for remand to the CDC without vacator. So the court says, while the court recognizes the criticism about nationwide injunctive relief, and admittedly share some of the skepticism about it, the weight of authority and judicial practice instructs that vacating this is the appropriate remedy for an APA violation. The court even goes further and says there's another independent reason such relief is necessary to grant complete relief to plaintiffs. Whatever doubts surround nationwide injunctive relief in general, there is no doubt that an Article III court may administer complete relief between the parties, even if this involves the determination of legal rights, which otherwise would not be within the range of its authority. Stated simply, incidental benefit to non-parties does not deprive Article III courts of exercising their historic power of equity to provide complete relief to the plaintiffs before it. And awarding complete relief here requires finding that the mask mandate is, in fact, null and void. The court says the difficulty of distinguishing the named plaintiffs from millions of other travelers, both for government actors and the myriad of private companies, individuals, and local governments bound to enforce the mandate with best efforts almost ensures that a limited liability would be no remedy at all. How is the ride-sharing driver, flight attendant, or bus driver to know someone is a plaintiff to this lawsuit with permission to enter mask-free? 
The identification problem is compounded further for the geographically dispersed members of Health Freedom Defense Fund. Remember, we said at the beginning that they had members all over the place. So the court says there seems to be no adequate assurances that the government can provide that its agents or an unwitting enforcer will not violate this court's order and deprive plaintiffs of their remedy. Thus, completely vacating this judgment, in addition to being the ordinary APA remedy, is necessary here specifically to remedy plaintiff's injury. In conclusion, it's indisputable that the public has a strong interest in combating the spread of COVID. In pursuit of that end, the CDC issued the mask mandate, but the mandate exceeded the CDC's statutory authority, improperly invoked the good cause exception to notice and comment rulemaking, and failed to adequately explain its decisions. Because our system does not permit agencies to act unlawfully, even in pursuit of desirable ends, the court declares unlawful and vacates the mask mandate. Okay, so usually in these, you know, fun videos, we end with the end of the case, but there's a few more things that I want to talk about. And again, I want to try my best to avoid stepping into politics, but from an administrative law procedural perspective, there's a lot we can learn from the aftermath of this case. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention ruled that the mandate was necessary for public health, but they were thinking about whether to appeal this decision or not. An appeal risks creating a precedent that could permanently constrain the agency. And this is what a lot of the news articles talked about. The most visited one that I saw uh, was the, the buzz was around this New York Times article. So the Biden administration, after the decision was issued, the Biden administration actually first said, you know, we're not going to appeal unless the CDC says that it's necessary. And then when the CDC was like, yeah, you know, we're a bunch of scientists. We don't really care about constitutional law. We care about like spread of viruses. We don't care about, you know, individual liberty. We care about spread of viruses. Like we do think just straight from a scientific perspective, from a medical perspective, it would be best if everybody was masked, right? Especially if they're like on, you know, shoved onto airplanes together. So once the Biden administration heard that, they decided to go forward and challenge this decision. So the decision from the Biden administration actually just came two days after the court struck down the mask mandate. And the CDC wants to keep the mandate intact, but also they're worried that pressing the appeal to preserve the public health powers that it has might be a bigger issue than just dealing with this one issue of the mask. But the thing is that doing so is potentially risky because the Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit is the court that will likely hear the case. It's considered, at least by the New York Times, to also have a conservative bend. And the case could end up also before the Supreme Court, which, you know, you, you, we, we like to believe and we, you know, really do try to believe that judges and justices wear black robes. They don't wear blue or red robes, right? They are above the politics. But um, we can get a sense of what they believe and what they will do based on the circles that they were in politically before they were appointed and how they have expressed themselves previously. So if it were to go to the 11th Circuit from the district court level and or if it went to the Supreme Court, the decision from this court on the district court level could be upheld. Then the decision could permanently weaken the CDC's authority in general to, to issue the kind of mandates in the future that it feels like it may have to issue, it have to take all these additional steps, you know, notice, comment, etc. And the White House press secretary said that appealing this decision is important for preserving the CDC's future public health authority. So just to focus for a minute on what the actual notice and comment rulemaking procedure is, the decision spoke a little bit about it. There's much more fleshed out analysis of the procedure available on the Administrative Conference of the United States website. The ACUS is an independent federal agency that develops recommendations to improve administrative processes and procedure. It is a branch of the government. It's got a .gov. It's acus.gov. And there is this really pretty good in information interchange bulletin number 14 that specifically talks about notice and comment rulemaking. That's what you see on your screen over here. So. Federal agencies routinely issue rules to implement and interpret statutes and explain how they'll exercise their discretion and describe their procedures and organization. In order to do that, they have to follow this procedure that you see. Number one has to be noticing uh, the agency issuing a proposed rulemaking notice. And that means they publish in the Federal Register 
and it has to describe the proposed rule, the legal authority for the rule, and the opportunities for public participation. Often, it's also available like on websites and things like that. The goal is to notice the public. Hey, guys, we're about to do something substantial, significant. Here's your chance for input. Number two is that the agency provides an opportunity for public comment, right? The actual, the 30 days there, at least 30 days where the public gets to say, hey, yeah, we think this is good or we think this is bad or we think, you know, whatever we think, this is this is our input. This is the chance. And again, because these people, it's, it's bureaucracy. They're not elected officials. It's delegated power from Congress. So let the people speak and hear them out. Do they like this? Do they not like this? Do they have suggestions? You can make it better in certain ways. Then the agency has to consider the comments and develop the final rule. If it decides to issue a final rule, the agency develops the regulatory test along with a preamble explaining the rule's basis and purpose and responding to all significant issues raised in the comments. And then finally, publication of the rule is the final step. Step four, they actually have to publish the final rule and preamble in the Federal Register. The notice must specify the rule's effective date which must be at least 30 days after publication in the Federal Register. And obviously these things did not happen in our case, but this is the standard procedure that the court was very concerned about in the opinion that were not followed. And this brings us to an interesting question. Like the Biden administration is moving forward with its appeal to reinstate the mask mandate, but what is it really seeking to accomplish? Like what does it really want and intend to fight for? The article that I put on your screen here, it talks about how the administration really has shifted away from masks as critical to the pandemic fight for the past two months. President Biden and other top officials in his administration have increasingly been presenting masks as a matter of personal choice. So like, what are they actually intending to do here? They're not seeking an immediate stay. From a procedural perspective, they could have decided to say this is so important that for procedural reasons, we, in the meantime, while the appeal is pending, appeals, you know, they don't happen overnight. The appellate court needs the time to get it right. It usually takes, you know, time to issue these decisions. In the meantime, we want to stay. We want a timeout on issuing this decision. We want, in the meantime, as a matter of you know health policy, we want the mask mandate to stay in effect, at least for the general population, if not for these individual plaintiffs, for the meantime. And they did not do that. So the Justice Department was actually asked by a reporter why it did not seek an immediate stay. And the Attorney General Merrick Garland, remember, this is the same guy who... Obama tried to get Merrick Garland on the Supreme Court. So now Biden puts him as the attorney general and a reporter asks him, why hasn't your Justice Department, why have you not sought an immediate stay? And he said, you know what, this is a quote unquote tactical strategy question. And, you know, giving no further explanation, he basically said the matter would be resolved by litigators in the Justice Department. But he added that. Quote, our reason for appealing is we believe that the CDC has clear statutory authority for the mask mandate and the CDC had assessed that it is necessary for the health of the American people, particularly the traveling public. And similarly, later on in the article, it talks about how John Pierre, the principal deputy White House press sec secretary, told reporters that the Biden administration decided to appeal because the CDC, quote, must have the essential public health authority to make critical decisions now and during the future health crises that could come up. She said that's what's at stake in this uh, decision to appeal. So reporters started questioning, like after the decision came out, I don't understand. You're letting these days pass by without seeking a stay of the ruling. And that step could most immediately resurrect the mask mandate. So there were different legal scholars who chimed in on this. We have Lawrence Gostin from Georgetown University Law School, who said basically, the administration is giving up on the mask mandates. The administration's goal, he claims, is a legal principle, which is to ensure that the CDC has strong public health powers to fight COVID and fight future pandemics, and it appears much less important to them to quickly reinstate the mask mandate. Similarly, a professor from the University of Texas Law School said that if the government really wanted to fight its appeal all the way up, to a decision on whether to overturn this court case, then they totally botched this because it's Thursday and the ruling was on Monday and they haven't done anything about it yet. Vladek contended that the failure to seek a stay may make sense if the Biden legal team was instead trying to protect the CDC's power with no real intention of trying to get a higher court to reinstate this particular 
mask mandate. And then another professor, uh, Professor Goodwin from UC Irvine Law School, said that the standards for winning a request to stay a judicial order can be much higher than for an appeal, right? Because you're basically saying the court just ruled on this, but you know we're asking you to hold off on, on going forward uh, in the meantime while we're going forward with an appeal. So Professor Goodwin says that fighting for a stay and losing it would raise particular risks of an appeals court decision that could take a similarly narrow view of what the CDC may do in a public health crisis. And that, unlike a district court ruling, would also be a binding precedent. She says losing sends a very strong message, and not just for the matter that happens to be at hand, but for other cases related to public health and safety, right? It's very rare for a district court to cite to other district courts in looking for legal precedent and stare decisis and what's binding on the district court. It could happen if it's in that same district, in that same court, et cetera, but it's much more of a weight of authority if it's a decision that's issued by an appellate court. And so that's perhaps what the Biden administration is worried about here. And so finally, just to round out our discussion about the aftermath and what we could expect moving forward, I have, uh, I'm trying to be as balanced as possible here. I have the New York Times, which has obviously, as you've seen, done a lot of publishing in this area and reason as well, has put out some interesting uh, analysis on the mask mandates and, and the administration's possible perspective and where we go from here. So the New York Times has noted that while the CDC wants to keep the mandate intact, the biggest issue is preserving the public health powers of the CDC. The administration feels that the court decision was too restrictive in reading the law in what the CDC has in terms of power to fight pandemics and public health crises, etc., that's why they want to move forward with the appeal if they move forward. And they may not be specifically looking to reinstate the mask mandate, but more looking at the long-term game. And even if the Biden administration wins the case, the Times notes that there may still be backlash among Americans. You know, election season is upon us. The midterms are coming up. And it seems that the majority of Americans feel quite liberated in being able to fly without a mask anymore, being able to take a train without a mask anymore. So they want to be sensitive to that as well. Reason Magazine asks if the CDC's mask mandate is necessary for public health, as the CDC claims, then why didn't the DOJ seek a stay to restore it? That's been our question that, as I noted, was actually asked to Merrick Garland. And what Reason says is that the Biden administration's main priority seems to be leaving the agency's authority vague enough to allow for future interventions. But the Public Health Service Act authorizes the CDC to make and enforce such regulations that, in its judgment, are necessary to prevent the introduction, transmission, or spread of communicable diseases, right? That is, as the, the court brought from 42 U.S.C. Uh, 264 Section A, the problem that the court talked about was that you can't just read this language as a general grant of power because that would give the CDC a breathtaking amount of authority. There have to be, you know, restrictions. And the court found it very implausible that the CDC could basically do whatever it wants based on this law that was on the books for a long time and was very rarely used, you know, for the past 75 years, 76 years. Does this allow the CDC to implement nationwide lockdowns, vaccine mandates, highly invasive limits on personal behavior, right? Where is the limit there? It's doubtful that the delegation of such vast authority to the CDC would be consistent with the separation of powers, which limits the executive branch having that role in lawmaking or with federalism, since protecting public health is primarily a state and local function. And of course, the argument that the court made was that the broad interpretation of Section 264A seemed inconsistent with the Next sentence, which lists specific disease control measures that allow for the authority to be granted, right? That was the whole inspection, fumigation, disinfection, sanitation, pest extermination, and destruction of animals or articles that are infected or contaminated, right? So the reason article points out that the 11th Circuit doesn't have to accept all of the district court's arguments against the mask mandate to agree in principle with the core of the decision that it was legally invalid. 
And even if it agrees with the CDC that the mandate fits within Section 264A, that will not amount to endorsing the sweeping powers that the agency unsuccessfully asserted in the eviction moratorium case, which the Supreme Court already had rejected. The article notes that the Biden administration may be hoping for a different outcome, that if a case is on appeal, when the dispute becomes moot for reasons unrelated to the litigation, an appeals court can remand it to the district court with instructions not only to dismiss the case, but to vacate the district court's ruling. That would wipe it from the books. And Reason actually quotes that New York Times article that says that the Biden administration may be giving itself that option after the mandate's planned expiration on May 3rd. Instead of clarifying the CDC's statutory authority, that result would leave it vague, allowing the agency, in the words of Reason.com, to continue auditioning for the role of disease dictator.